When we think of the medieval period, images of knights in shining armor, grand castles, and epic battles often come to mind. However, beyond these popularized aspects, there is a whole world of fascinating traditions and customs that are rarely taught in history class. These lesser-known medieval traditions provide a deeper understanding of the daily lives and cultural practices of people during this era. From peculiar wedding rituals to unique forms of entertainment, this video will take you on a journey through time, uncovering 15 captivating medieval traditions that will both surprise and delight you. Prepare to be transported to a world filled with intriguing customs that will broaden your knowledge and appreciation of this remarkable historical period. Number 15. Trial by Ordeal Trial by ordeal was a judicial practice in medieval Europe in which the guilt or innocence of the accused was determined by subjecting them to a physically dangerous or painful task. The core belief behind this method was that divine intervention would reveal the truth. The most common types of ordeals were the ordeal by fire and the ordeal by water. In the ordeal by fire, the accused had to carry a hot iron bar for a certain distance or pick up a stone from boiling water. If their hands healed cleanly within a prescribed period, they were acquitted. In the ordeal by water, the accused was thrown into a body of water with hands and feet bound. If they sank, they were deemed innocent, if they floated, they were guilty. Trial by ordeal was not a foolproof system. There were many factors that could influence the outcome of an ordeal, such as the accused physical condition, the weather, and the skill of the executioner. As a result, the results of ordeals were often unpredictable and could lead to innocent people being convicted. Despite its flaws, trial by ordeal remained a popular form of justice in medieval Europe for centuries. It was not until the 15th century that it began to decline, as more formalized legal systems developed and people began to question its fairness. Trial by ordeal is a fascinating glimpse into the medieval mind. It reflects the belief that divine intervention could be used to resolve disputes and the willingness of people to submit themselves to pain and suffering in the name of justice. While it may seem barbaric to us today, it was once seen as a legitimate way to determine guilt or innocence. Number 14. Tithing and Frank Pledge Tithing and Frank Pledge were two systems of community self-regulation in medieval England. Tithing was a system in which every adult male belonged to a group of ten households. The members of a tithing were responsible for each other's behavior, and if one member committed a crime, the others were obligated to bring him to justice. Frank Pledge was a similar system, but it was organized at the hundred level, which was a unit of local government that consisted of about 100 families. Each hundred was divided into tithings, and the tithing men, or leaders of the tithings, were responsible for keeping the peace in their area. Tithing and Frank Pledge were both based on the principle of mutual responsibility. The idea was that if everyone in the community was responsible for the behavior of their neighbors, then crime would be less likely to occur. These systems were also seen as a way to promote social cohesion and cooperation. Tithing and Frank Pledge were gradually replaced by more formal systems of law enforcement and justice in the 16th and 17th centuries. However, they played an important role in maintaining order and stability in medieval England. What do you think of this system? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. Number 13. Alchemy in Everyday Life Alchemy was a complex and multifaceted practice that was deeply ingrained in the daily life of the medieval period. While it is often associated with the mystical and the arcane, alchemy was also a practical science that had a significant impact on many aspects of medieval life. One of the most important areas where alchemy was used was in medicine. Alchemists were the pharmacists and metallurgists of their time, and they were responsible for the preparation of medicinal remedies. They used their knowledge of the properties of different substances to create treatments for a wide range of illnesses, from salves and ointments to potions. Alchemy was also used in the arts and crafts. Alchemists developed new techniques for dyeing textiles, making glass, and producing perfumes. They also experimented with ways to improve the quality of metals and to create new alloys. In addition to its practical applications, alchemy was also seen as a way to achieve spiritual enlightenment. Alchemists believed that by studying the transformation of matter, they could gain insights into the nature of the universe and the human soul. They often used symbolic language and imagery to express their ideas, and their work was often infused with religious and philosophical meaning. 
While alchemy may seem like a strange and mysterious practice to modern eyes, it was an important part of medieval life. Alchemists were respected members of the community, and their work had a significant impact on many aspects of medieval society. Number 12. Courtly Love and Troubadours Courtly love and troubadours were important cultural and social phenomena in the Middle Ages. They emerged from the poetic imaginations of troubadours, lyric poets who thrived in the Occitan-speaking regions of what is now southern France. Courtly love was a code of conduct that idealized romantic love and devotion. It was based on the idea that a knight could achieve spiritual enlightenment through his love for a lady, who was usually of higher social standing and often married. The love was supposed to be platonic and unrequited, and it was often expressed through poetry, music, and art. Troubadours were the primary purveyors of courtly love. They traveled from court to court, singing and reciting their poems about love, chivalry, and adventure. Their work helped to spread the ideals of courtly love throughout Europe. Courtly love was a complex and multifaceted phenomenon. It had both positive and negative aspects. On the one hand, it promoted the ideals of love, honor, and fidelity. On the other hand, it could also be seen as restrictive and unrealistic. Despite its flaws, courtly love had a lasting impact on European culture. It influenced the development of literature, music, and art. It also helped to shape the way people thought about love and relationships. Number 11. Medieval Guilds and Secret Handshakes Medieval guilds were organizations of craftsmen and merchants that were formed to protect the economic interests of their members. They also played a significant role in social and cultural life. Guilds were often founded by master craftsmen who wanted to ensure that their apprentices received high-quality training. They also wanted to control the quality of goods produced by their members and to prevent unfair competition. To achieve these goals, guilds set standards for apprenticeships, established prices for goods and services, and regulated the number of apprentices and journeymen that a master craftsman could have. They also enforced codes of conduct that governed the behavior of their members. In addition to their economic functions, guilds also played an important role in social and cultural life. They provided social welfare benefits for their members, such as pensions and medical care. They also sponsored religious festivals and other events. Some guilds also had secret rituals, including handshakes and symbols, that were used to identify members and to solidify their sense of community. These rituals were often seen as a way to protect the guild's secrets and to create a sense of exclusivity. The influence of guilds declined in the late Middle Ages, but they played an important role in shaping medieval society. They helped to promote economic development, to protect the interests of workers, and to foster social and cultural cohesion. Number 10. Jesters and Fools Jesters and fools were important figures in medieval European courts. They were not just entertainers, but also social commentators, critics, and communicators. They were allowed to say things that would be considered seditious or even blasphemous if uttered by others. This was because they were protected by the guise of the fool. Jesters and fools were often granted a license to speak truth to power. They could mock, satirize, and question the decisions and actions of rulers. This candid critique wrapped in humor could provide rulers with perspectives that they might not hear from their more cautious advisors. Jesters and fools also served as a voice for public opinion. They could speak out about the concerns of the common people, and their words could be a powerful force for social change. In addition to their political role, jesters and fools also played an important social role. They were often the only people who could speak freely to the nobility. They could use their humor to diffuse tension, to build relationships, and to promote understanding. Jesters and fools were complex and multifaceted figures. They were not just entertainers, but also important social and political actors. Their role in medieval society is a reminder of the power of humor and satire to challenge authority and to promote change. Number 9. The Ducking Stool The ducking stool was a wooden chair that was suspended from a long arm and placed over a body of water. It was used as a form of punishment in medieval Europe, primarily against women accused of being scolds or nagging wives. The ducking stool was not intended to be lethal, but it was still a very unpleasant experience. The accused would be strapped into the chair and repeatedly plunged into the water. This could be very cold and uncomfortable, and it could also lead to drowning.
In addition to the physical punishment, the ducking stool was also a public humiliation. The accused would be put on display in front of a crowd, and they would be jeered and mocked. This was meant to deter others from behaving in a similar way. The ducking stool was also rooted in a complex theology of water. In Christian symbolism, water had dual meanings, it was both a purifying element used in baptism and a symbol of chaos and danger, as seen in the biblical flood. Dunking an individual could be interpreted as a form of exorcism or purification, expelling the sin or disorder they had brought into the community. The ducking stool was used in England and other parts of Europe from the 12th century until the 19th century. It was eventually replaced by more humane forms of punishment, but it remains a reminder of the harsh punishments that were once meted out for minor offenses. Number 8. Wandering Minstrels Wandering minstrels were itinerant performers who traveled from place to place, entertaining people with their songs, stories, and poems. They were often seen as free-spirited musicians who brought joy and laughter to all who heard them. However, they were also more than just entertainers. They were also newsbearers, social commentators, and even political activists. Minstrels played an important role in preserving and disseminating oral history. They sang of great battles and legendary heroes, but they also sang of everyday life. Their songs helped to keep alive the stories and traditions of the people, and they also served as a form of social commentary. Minstrels often used their songs to criticize the powerful or to speak out against injustice. In addition to their role as entertainers and storytellers, minstrels were also important agents of cultural exchange. They traveled widely, and they brought their songs and stories to new audiences. This helped to spread ideas and information across different regions and cultures. Wandering minstrels were a vital part of the social fabric of medieval Europe. They were not just entertainers, they were also important cultural figures who played a significant role in shaping the world around them. Number 7. Feast of Fools The Feast of Fools was a medieval festival celebrated around the New Year, culminating on the Feast of the Circumcision, January 1st. It allowed clergy and laity alike to temporarily invert the established social and religious hierarchies. For one day, junior clergy and even lay members of the community could assume the roles of bishops or priests while engaging in various forms of jest, satire, and parody. The Feast of Fools was not merely an ecclesiastical version of a masquerade ball. It was an institutionalized form of social critique and renewal. By appending the usual hierarchies, it created a space to question and critique the existing social and religious order. The inversion of roles acted as a mirror, reflecting both the absurdities and the sanctities of daily life and religious practice. Some scholars suggest that this annual spectacle served as a pressure valve for societal tensions, letting off steam in a controlled environment. Moreover, the Feast of Fools had roots in earlier pagan traditions and Roman festivals like Saturnalia, where roles were also reversed and norms were temporarily set aside. This suggests a continuity and adaptation of pre-Christian cultural elements within medieval Christian practice. The Feast of Fools was eventually suppressed by the Catholic Church in the 16th century, but it remains an important reminder of the complex and nuanced ways in which medieval people understood and negotiated power, representation, and social cohesion. Number 6. Mystery Plays Mystery plays were a form of medieval drama that dramatized stories from the Bible. They were performed in open-air venues like market squares or in special wagons that traveled through towns. Mystery plays were often sponsored by guilds, religious institutions, or even civic authorities. What set mystery plays apart from other forms of religious expression was their inherently participatory nature. Unlike a sermon or a sacred text, which were largely one-way channels of communication, mystery plays involved the community as both spectators and performers. Ordinary citizens took on the roles of biblical figures, bringing a sense of immediacy and personal investment to these ancient stories. This active engagement allowed for a dynamic exchange of ideas where complex theological concepts were translated into accessible human drama. Mystery plays were not just theatrical performances, but rather complex social and religious events that served multiple functions. They were used for education, entertainment, spiritual engagement, and social critique. Mystery plays were a form of communal storytelling that allowed medieval society to explore, negotiate, and sometimes challenge their shared beliefs and values. They were a powerful tool for shaping public opinion and promoting social cohesion. 
Number 5. The Scold's Bridle The Scold's Bridle, also known as a brank, was a metal device that was used to silence women in medieval Europe. It was a type of muzzle that was fitted over the woman's head and had a bridle bit that was inserted into her mouth. The Scold's Bridle was used to punish women who were considered to be scolds, gossips, or witches. It was also used to silence women who spoke out against the established order. The Scold's Bridle was a cruel and humiliating punishment. The woman who was subjected to it was not only silenced, but she was also publicly shamed. She was often paraded through the streets, leading to further humiliation and ostracism. The Scold's Bridle was a symbol of the power that men had over women in medieval society. It was a way of controlling women's speech and behavior. It was also a way of punishing women who challenged the patriarchal order. The Scold's Bridle is no longer used, but it remains a reminder of the oppression that women have faced throughout history. It is a reminder of the ways in which women have been silenced and marginalized. It is also a reminder of the importance of fighting for freedom of speech and gender equality. Number 4. The Heretic's Fork The Heretic's Fork was a torture device used by the Inquisition to punish alleged heretics. It consisted of a two-pronged fork that was attached to a collar that was placed around the victim's neck. The fork was positioned in such a way that the prongs pierced the flesh under the victim's chin and the upper chest. This made it impossible for the victim to lower their head or lie down without experiencing excruciating pain. The heretic's fork was more than just a physical torture device. It was also a psychological weapon that was used to break down the victim's will and extract confessions. The victim was constantly reminded of the pain that they would experience if they did not cooperate. The heretic's fork was often used in conjunction with other forms of torture, such as waterboarding or the rack, to make the experience even more unbearable. The use of the heretic's fork was a dark chapter in human history. It is a reminder of the lengths that people will go to when they are determined to suppress dissent and enforce conformity. The heretic's fork is also a reminder of the importance of freedom of thought and the need to protect people from torture. Number 3. Sanctuary Laws Sanctuary laws were a set of regulations that were enacted in medieval Europe to control what individuals could wear, eat, or own based on their social rank. The primary aim of these laws was to maintain social hierarchy and limit extravagant spending and ostentation among the populace. These regulations were surprisingly detailed specifying the types of fabrics one could wear, the amount of embroidery allowed, or even the length of a knight's sword based on his income. They were a way to instantly recognize someone's social standing, thereby upholding the rigid class system that characterized medieval Europe. The enforcement of sanctuary laws was serious business. Fines, public shaming, or even imprisonment could befall those who dared to breach them. Moreover, these laws were not static, they evolved in response to economic changes, emerging fashions, or shifts in political power. For example, laws became stricter in times of economic hardship to prevent social unrest or resentment among the lower classes. While sanctuary laws may appear repressive and controlling by modern standards, they serve as an important indicator of the values and concerns of medieval society. They reveal a world deeply concerned with social stability, where the overt display of wealth or ambition by those not born to it was seen as a potential threat to the established social order. Number 2. Wife Selling Wife selling was a practice in which a husband would sell his wife to another man in a public auction. The practice was not legally recognized as a form of divorce, but rather a way to publicly humiliate the wife and sever the marital ties. The practice of wife-selling was most common in England and Germany, and it is thought to have originated in the 12th century. It was most common among the lower classes, as it was a way for couples to end their marriages without having to go through the expensive and time-consuming process of a legal divorce. The wife-selling ritual typically involved the husband leading his wife to a market with a halter around her neck. The wife would then be auctioned off to the highest bidder. The auction was often a formality, and the wife may have been willing to be sold. In some cases, the wife selling was a desperate act by impoverished couples who saw it as the only way to separate and start anew. While wife selling may seem like a barbaric practice, it is important to understand the context in which it occurred. Divorce was difficult and expensive in medieval Europe, and wife selling was one way for couples to end their marriages without having to go through the legal system. The practice also reflects the limited economic and social opportunities available to women at the time. 
Wife selling was eventually outlawed in most European countries in the 19th century. However, it remains a reminder of the complex social and legal constraints that women faced in the past. Number 1. The Ordeals of Knighthood The Ordeals of Knighthood were a series of rituals, trials, and ordeals that aspiring warriors had to go through in order to become knights. These ordeals were designed to test and prepare the young men for their future responsibilities as knights, which included fighting in wars, protecting the weak and innocent, and upholding the ideals of chivalry. The first stage of the ordeals was patehood, which began at the age of seven or eight. During this stage, the young man would serve a knight or a noble household, learning the basics of combat, horsemanship, and courtly manners. He would also learn about the ideals of chivalry and how to be a good knight. The second stage of the ordeals was squirehood, which began at the age of 14. During this stage, the young man would continue his training in combat and horsemanship. He would also begin to accompany the knight in battles and other military campaigns. He would also learn how to care for the knight's armor and weapons. The final stage of the ordeals was dubbing, which was the ceremony in which the young man was officially knighted. This ceremony usually involved the knight striking the young man on the shoulders with a sword symbolizing his entry into the Brotherhood of Knights. The young man would then take a series of oaths to uphold the ideals of chivalry. The ordeals of knighthood were a rigorous process, but they were designed to create knights who were not only skilled warriors, but also virtuous individuals. They were physical, psychological, and spiritual trials that embedded the medieval ideals of honor, piety, and social responsibility into the very identity of the knight. Thank you for watching. If you liked this video, please don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. See you in the next video.